AI is coming everywhere and private practice is no exception, but what might it look like? And how would you as a practice owner get started? What are some of the speed bumps you might hit along the way? Well, my guest today is deep into this area and he's gonna share his insights with us. I'm Carl White, Principal at Mark Advisory Group, which is a healthcare marketing agency, and I'm also the host of Practice Care. The mission for both is the same, and that's to help private practice owners stay private. Not only is that usually what they want, but care is better when the provider owns the practice because that's when they're gonna have the most freedom to make the clinical decisions that they think are best. It's just different when somebody else owns the practice. Eventually, usually their agenda starts to creep in, more for the provider to think about. Let's just keep it easier, keep it private, and make sure that they can, that they can stay that way. My guest today is James Jordan. James is a healthcare and life sciences expert. He is a distinguished service professor of healthcare and biotechnology at Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College, the president of Stratectic, the national co-chairman of the Bio Bootcamp, and the founder of the Healthcare Data Center. He's published numerous articles and books on innovation, startups, intellectual property, and health systems. Jordan's been a senior executive for Fortune 100 companies and has participated in and led angel and venture capital investments. As CEO of the Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse, he, where he worked with 493 companies and invested in 93 of them. Jim has held high-ranking positions in companies such as McKesson Corporation, where he served as senior vice president, and Johnson & Johnson, where he was vice president for marketing and many other noteworthy ventures. As an author, speaker, and consultant, he works with hospitals, health systems, medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies, diagnostic companies, biotech, and health IT, Jim is an active industry expert, always looking for ways to improve the business of healthcare. My God, you've got a lot going on. Thank you for carving out some time to come on to practice pleasure. care. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's whatever, this huge topic, very important. We're going to get into it uh, very shortly. But let me start where I start with every guest. Uh, fill in the gaps on your, on your background. I'm curious how you got into this, I was going to say corner of the world of healthcare, but AI is not, takes up much more than a corner. So How'd you get here? So I, I started my, I love technology and I started my career right out of school in the defense industry and realized as cool as that was, that wasn't uh, socially responsible. And so <laughs> I had an opportunity to, to get into healthcare with a, a company called CR Bard, which mm -hmm. actually brought angioplasty to the United States, which is yep. a long, long time ago. And so I spent the, the beginning of my career in the, in the, uh, finance operations, quality oh, wow. I was a sales rep at one point in time in marketing. Um, in engineering, and I just really focused on the the processes of business, which mm -hmm. um, ironically has really been what my career is all about. So as I went through medical devices, I got into drug distribution and healthcare IT through through McKesson, and so mm -hmm. you know by that point I'd done the all the product side, and I found my way into the investment side with uh, the Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse, which is again not something that I really intended to do. It was just an opportunity that popped up because a former recruiter from Johnson and Johnson that worked with me uh, heard about this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I got to see the investor side and help doctors and scientists bring technologies to market. And we had a, a for-profit plan and a non-profit plan. And so the goal of the non-profit in startups, they call it the Valley of Death, you know, the first, the first, you know, <laughs> 5 million to 50 million, depending if you're a drug company in are really hard to get. And yeah. a lot of companies fail at that point because the original founders, the scientists and the doctors, um, don't necessarily know the business models and what you need to do for a startup. Yeah. And a startup in and of itself is a simultaneous formula, sort of focusing on the customer, getting funding and having an exit liquidity event, which are, you know most of these folks don't have that experience. And so our job was to help them do that. Mm -hmm. And I found my way uh, to Carnegie Mellon University purely uh, by accident. I went and spoke to the Dean around 2005 about healthcare is changing and you know, you're a top school, what are you doing? And yeah. I used him apparently and, and ended up working with them uh, on part-time basis for, for the past 15 years. And I, had the the most brilliant faculty in the world um we had to create a curriculum and so i actually created this website called healthcaredata.center where we built consensus around what should be and what shouldn't be mm -hmm. and along the way in the startup side i got involved in robotics and, and artificial intelligence applications and and actually um this month we'll be filing with one of my clients my first ai application which uh, for a patent which is very exciting okay yeah wow so it's I guess maybe AI was sort of the next natural progression, given the trajectory of your career. You know, well, well I think AI was the progression of of analytics. Um, 
you know, AI in and of itself is is pulling together large data sets and, and yeah. being able to find insights that traditional methods can't do. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, they help with process, they create new business models, and they create new products. Um, and so there's sort of three things that they do. And, and those three things can be applied to, you know, every business. Yeah. So let's get into it to AI and specifically we're going to zero it on private practices. It's such a large topic. There's no convenient way in. So let's just jump in. When you think about a private practice, uh, what are some specific areas where you can see AI really making like a, you know, transformative difference? So I think of my friends that that go into private practice right out of school, uh, what they're they're shocked by is that what they do is very little of what the practice needs to be running. So you have all these inputs, you have um, insurance and medical equipment supplies, and you have staff and you have electronic health records and billing and compliance and mm -hmm. patient engagement and quality systems. And so I think my, my hope in the long run is, is getting physicians back to doing what they, they really want to do, which is mm -hmm. work with patients, help people and, and get back to sort of, you know, the, the physical exam again, or, or being able to interact with people more as opposed to taking notes. Yeah. And I think that's the real opportunity for, or the real vision of, of where we're going is to get back to that. Now there's, there's opportunities and cautions all along the way, of course. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing it as operational efficiency or, you know, so I think the first phase is so this is going to this this transition is going to be highly regulated as it relates to information that touches the patient or, or yeah. what I would call therapeutic decision making. Yeah. So I, I think what we're going to see is a recognition that we can take the 60% of the time the doctor is actually on administration doing other things and start gnawing away at that because if there is a database mistake in there, it's mm -hmm. not going to cost a life, right? Yeah. And if you look at robotics and the different things they're doing in the operating rooms, they're, they're a closed loop system. They're highly validated. And mm -hmm. so I think it's going to take a while for, um, I'll call them decision support systems to, to happen. And I think we'll probably see those decision support systems start out with imaging because there's a, a really good um, base that's been established on, on that imaging. Okay. And then I think there's going to be, particularly for rural physician practices, I think there's going to be um, decision support system. So if you remember, like when we were in school and you had your statistics and all the, the, the really interesting insights were on the tail of the distribution, right? Yeah. And you needed a large sample size to do that. And there's a reason why the Mayo Clinic and Mass General and those guys are who they are is because they see the high volume of cases and they see the worst cases. And that information needs to be shared. And so I think that, um, AI will allow us to share that cutting edge information so that when we see a patient, it can be top of mind or it can at least be something that we think about so we don't have to spend so much time investigating a particular case. So, okay. So you're seeing areas in, I'll call it again, operational efficiency, so note taking, mm -hmm. all sorts of other sort of manual processes that somebody has to do that can be taken out of their hands and automated and sort of performed those tasks performed yeah, that's one area. portals electronic prescribing um you know medical lab testing i i just i have a wellness doctor and it struck me that i got my lab results um the same day that he got the lab results which you know years ago that was not something that you'd ever really happening and on quest now there's uh i've been with them since 2012 and i've got actually a timeline for all the various tests and it's actually sort of under what I would call a graphic statistical process control, where you can actually mm -hmm. trend these things over time. And I think those are incredibly helpful information systems mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So I think we're going to try to take the, you know, if you look at financial statements, you have the, the administrative costs. I'm hoping we can take the administrative costs down so that we can spend more time on, on clinical support. Mm -hmm. I think that we have a revenue opportunity with telemedicine. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to see more patients, um, have portals where people can ask questions and maybe pre-screen themselves a bit, and it can yeah. just be a more of an efficient process. Yeah. And I think, you know, we we have physician burnout being a huge issue in this country. We have yeah. four physicians a year that commit suicide mm -hmm. over, over this kind of situation. And I think that um, we can get them back to helping the patient and, and not be away from, you know, taking their personal time and doing administration. I'm wondering if if when you have these conversations or you look at these areas, because the, one of the first places my head went to is 
is insurance going to look as, as this is a chance to, to, you know, cut reimbursement as well. If you're not as busy or if you can see more or whatever, you know, we just, some of, I don't really know how it breaks down, but not much of the reimbursed amount for your or my annual exam goes towards the administrative burden, but probably some of it does. The idea would be to, for them to say, let's just leave it alone and you can, you know, practice X, you can capture the efficiencies and things get a bit more normal, but reimbursement so rarely goes up. Um, but we're, yeah, we're moving to know. these value-based um, approaches and and we're not, we, we sort of say we're value-based, meaning we're going to make you do more for less, but we're, we're still a little bit of a piecework, right? If you're a, a general practitioner, how many people did you see today? That's what you, you get your money. Well, that's on. how, right. Like and, so and, in dental, they, it's literally the word production is used. Yes. You can, you can fill in the blanks on what that means, but yeah. But I think there's, there's um, more sophisticated uh, profit sharing models that are out there that integrated delivery networks participate in and bigger groups participate in. And they participate in it because one, they can, one, they have the information and, and two, they have the systems. And I think with mm -hmm. AI being deployed in, in cloud-based systems, I think that you know smaller practices will get an opportunity to be part of that. But I, I think that... Um, there'll always be this battle of, of dialing back. Mm -hmm. um, that's what insurance, you know, insurance does now. Yeah. I, I, I think, and this is a whole separate dialogue, but yeah. I, I think why does the insurance industry by regulation get to keep 20 cents in the dollar? Um, they're about at 15.1 when our hospitals are, are running at 4% profit and our physician practices are, you know, under 15 and mm -hmm. probably being generous there. Mm -hmm. It's quite the onion. Yes, quite the onion to be peeled. Absolutely. Um, physicians are probably going to have a lot of concerns about AI, right? Even, even you know, what do you mean somebody else could take notes? Or what do you mean some other process or whatever could take notes? How do you address these concerns? Because if well, there's real value, real capture, real benefits, um, or real so, regulation, so, you're right. So how do right. you get into this? So I, I think if we were to make a, a, a sort of a uh, green light, yellow light, red light. Yeah. The, the, the red light is thinking that someday, and I'm sure, you know, I, I can't say it will never happen because in a hundred years, you can say it's probably going to be there, right? Artificial <laughs> intelligence can make therapeutic recommendations. Um, yeah. I think we're far off from that. And yeah. I think the the FDA is 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 going to be a, an advocate for making sure that, that mm -hmm. that's not the case. Um, otherwise, the AI companies would have to spend billions and billions of dollars to validate their models, and they're not going to do it. So yeah. I think we're going to we're going to be a decision support. Okay, and, and that can be very helpful. And so you've probably heard the term AI medicine, precision medicine, you know, mm -hmm. all those terms. Yeah. But basically, let me give you an example that's uh, one that's pretty good for private practice. It's a company called Aerial Therapeutics that um, focuses on pancreatitis, and they have. Yeah research that says, you know, from, from 0.1 to 0.15, this is a pathway a patient follows and you can run that model over physician practice. So if you and I walk in, I, I have that genetic tendency. You don't, there may be something that you see as a general practitioner that has absolutely not, wouldn't concern you in the least, mm -hmm. but for me, it tells me I'm on a continuum. Okay. Well, there's two of us, he can sort of maintain that, but you know, they're running thousands of patients. So how do you know and when someone's coming in and how do you get cautioned on that? So I think these systems can provide that, that kind of feedback. And mm -hmm. I think that would be very, very helpful for people. I okay. think it'd be helpful for rural physicians. I think where the challenge is going to be is when someone has a malpractice case and someone says decision support system said a and you did b and oh interesting right i didn't so think I, you were going to so say I, that yeah I right you relied too much on a decision support system absolutely what i thought and, you were going to say by its very definition even the definition of the fda a decision support system is not therapeutic recommendation that's yeah. the physician's job so but i think that's going to be the litmus test to to make sure we we stay in the right line in this situation so legal risk, legal concern, depending on if it's used or misused or overused, mm -hmm. what other concerns do you see? Like I, I think of, well, I, what other concerns do you see? And what, what so do you I, say I in response? There's, um, there's IT infrastructure and cybersecurity costs. Yeah. You know, we, we, we have these competing 
uh, national priorities are interoperability, right? So mm -hmm. if I want to talk to your practice, we should be able to talk to each other. But if you're a cybersecurity guy, you say every time I add a new connection, I add risk. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and and the penalties are going up for these cybersecurity issues. So mm -hmm. it's going to be something that becomes um, a, a little concerning. Now you do see cloud-based cybersecurity companies forming. Mm -hmm. um, I do see, I talk to, I have, as I mentioned, I have a podcast on my own and I, yeah. I talk to a couple of physicians in city areas that are now spinning out after being acquired into private practice again. Okay. And right. it's because they can now get cloud-based EHRs, mm -hmm. you know, um, and other, other things that they need and they don't have to have the technical staff. So in one, in one case, that's enabling. Mm-hmm. I, and I wonder about, you know, <laughs> healthcare IT generally, at least from my exposure to it, it's never been described as, as a category, you know, revolutionary or cutting edge. It's a lot of legacy systems out there. My God. Um, as a patient, I, I have a few different physicians and that means I have as many apps because they're on different systems. Mm -hmm. And, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you just think about, you know, for this to work well, one of the conditions would be that information moves pretty frictionlessly um, where it needs to go in the right time, it just seems like the infrastructure would be. So if I'm private practice X, maybe in the back of my mind is what's the practicality? I mean, who who can go first? Because we, we have six different systems. You know what I mean? So I don't know if you've been following the the Epic suing the, the U.S. government on. Um, no, Epic's you know, one of them. Epic's one of the three. Yeah, yeah uh, so, so. So and a question, former client had a little thing, I should tell you, a little plaque, and it, it said, do epic shit. And I just looked at it, and I <laughs> laughed every time, because <laughs> one of the meanings was that. <laughs> so I think if you if you follow the history of um, enterprise management systems, and I'm a nerd, so I've followed it. You know, we had, we had 20, <laughs> 30 years ago, we had materials requirement planning, and then we had enterprise resource planning. And everyone said that you can't have a standard platform because we all have unique words. And, and basically the companies put all their toggle switches together and basically look yeah. what you want and you can get your model to do that. Yeah. And the electronic health record people have said, we're unique. And so they're actually fearful of the SAPs coming in and the Oracle's mm -hmm. coming in, right? Because they have massive resources and mm -hmm. already today, Microsoft and many of those big companies, Apple are already in the hospital yeah. system. So yeah. they're a, that's a 400 to $500 billion industry on that side. Whereas you have the electronic health record in the US roughly is two estimates, nine to 12 billion. I, I, I'm more on the 12 billion side. Okay. So they can swallow them pretty quickly if they're yeah. respectful. Now you saw, um, you saw Oracle by Cerner and they they okay. had a disaster with the the veterans administration because they didn't understand or um they tried to upgrade too quickly without understanding the unique processes got of it healthcare got it and i i think we need to fix those i think you know when i talk to europeans um they they may have for example in france they have private and public and mm -hmm. you can you can have both mm -hmm. but they all ride on the public paperwork system it's right. one system. Yeah. Talked to a doctor in New Jersey last week who was had thirty two contracts that he was managing to get reimbursement. How do you, how do you? Uh, I, right. Yeah. Like that all has to be simplified somehow, and you've got everybody funding the. What is what is Epic suing the government for? Um, that there's a, a committee that's been put together about how artificial intelligence should be deployed throughout the entire industry, including healthcare, and. Um, it's been a, a very private committee. It's not been very, very public. And it's been by people who would benefit on the four to five hundred million dollar side ah. to come in. And they're saying, hey, we need some disclosure of what's going on beside there. And there's a there's an interesting battle going on on I, I think personally, um, I, I think I talked to the Wall Street Journal about this a few weeks ago. If you think about intellectual property, we're starting to say we need to know the bias of your data. We need to know where your data comes from. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a patent. That's not a trademark. That's not a copyright. True. What is it? It's kind of a trade secret like the Coca-Cola formula. It so, is, isn't it? It's a data right? set. Yeah. And the, and the minute that that Coca-Cola formula goes public, there's no protection. Coke's dead. So I, yeah. I think we're missing something here. And I think that um, although Epic's, in, you know, might have a, a part of itself saying, you know, I'm trying to be protective of my industry. But the other part of it is I, if I let your AI in my system, then you are 
in fact, knowing what my system is, mm -hmm. right? And even, even today, you know, my wife works for an engineering company. They can't use chat GPT because when you put something in, it's becoming part of the Borg, if, if you will. Right? <laughs> Another company. horrible model. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, I think that's a legal issue out there we're going to have to deal with. So in the short term, I think the big AI initiatives that you're seeing on predictive analytics and stuff like that are actually coming inside of the epics and the current system. It's closed loop. It's not being attached. Mm hmm so what you and I have been talking about over the past 10 or 15 minutes or so is is it's sort of my take, the state of the industry where it's at, it's at, I'll say a very high level, very early days, probably many private practice owners and private practices are going to be on the other end of this once it, I mean, there's going to be some bumps along the way, but you know, what, what should a private practice owner, if they wanted to start bringing something in, you know, they're curious, like what, what what's some practical guidance? on adopting AI, just sit and wait, watch and see, you know, what do you? So, so I think it's, it's about process management. So you hear a lot of people talking about, you know, doing process excellence. So you have scheduling and checking patients in and providing yeah. medical services and billing insurance claims and staffing and inventory management and credentialing and all this. Um, the first step, I think, is is understanding what you have and, and having, you know, some process excellence on it. And, mm -hmm. and at the end of that, you'll probably find there's a particular software that you're going to pick up to help you with it. Okay. And I think the AI will come in with it. So, for example, um, there's a company, it's, it's publicly traded, but in the scheme of things, it's a small company. It's called Frasia. Okay. And they do things with scheduling and texting and, and, and all that. And so I wouldn't quite say they're artificial intelligence, but they have a lot of smart algorithms. There you go. So, so what you're going to find is when the artificial intelligence can be applied to that problem, the mm -hmm. physician's not going to have to worry about it. Frazier is going to worry about it and they're going to come in and they're going to tell them because if they can't differentiate themselves mm -hmm. with AI, mm -hmm. then the reality is they're, they're going to lose. So I think, you know, these coding, these marketing communications, you know, um, I was talking to a physician who was struggling finding someone to help market his his practice and reputation management. Mm. And, you know, I don't, he can have a low-level person working with a, a software called Jasper AI mm -hmm. that can spit out amazing stuff mm -hmm. uh, very, very quickly and cost-effectively. So I think if they manage their processes, which when I say that is is actually a really big gap, there's not a lot of people doing no. it. Um, but those process tools and software tools will result in, in, in the process and journey and trying to improve those. Yeah. So have a decent process first and then, because yeah. a lot of those processes, they sort of go to the, you know, that the, the hourly rate keeps getting pushed down because it's very repetitive, right? Like uh, validating insurance for a new patient. Um, could that be AI'd? Maybe. You know? Well, I would tell you that, um, you know, for example, Frasia does have a great system for validating that. There and, you go. And their software, which, you know, can go to several different places. So the, the question is, and, the, and this is an old concept. I mean, you go back to G and Jack Walsh with his workout program, you know, they had little little yarn they were using, red, yellow, green. And the mm -hmm. whole point was, do you once you put data in the system, you put it in once and you use it many times, mm -hmm. right? And, and so I think that's not something how you know, physician offices have been run. And um, a good friend of mine tells the story of, you know, the people that are running these offices um, are generally the the best person that the doctor has. You know, they mm -hmm. might have had an associate's degree. They put them to the local school. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, historically um, hiring Carnegie Mellon graduates or Harvard right. graduates to do these. Now that's starting to change. And I, I can see it in the employment of our students. It's definitely starting to change. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, those process excellence skills really need to be uh, brought into the practice. And it and, can it can give a good return on investment for physicians too. And it's, it's one of many topics I wish could somehow make their way into the curriculum of a medical school, a fill-in-the-blank training school, because practice is a business. And process excellence, good systems, good processes. And you can tell, like I... I I talked to a fair number myself. We've had a number of guests on on the on the podcast, and those who have systematized things and have that instinct, man, they just run really, really well, and they're much yeah, happier, I mean, into, and they're you know all sorts of things are better. Yeah, I mean, I've gone into hospital systems and physician practices, and and good old fashioned flow charting out, right? And it's amazing the redundancy that you you see, mm -hmm. and 
you know, generally the administrative staff is is really excited to participate in that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, generally a small practice doesn't have sort of a operations level person like J and J might have or right. these other companies. But you know, when I was at J and J or Boston Scientific or McKesson, we literally had a vice president of continuous improvement, and mm -hmm. all his, his and her job was was to go around to all the operating units and educate people on how to do these, you know, Six Sigma yep. uh, processes. Yep. We had some, I used to work at Baxter, similar. Yes. Whole very office, similar, yep. uh, yeah, and an instinct. And, a, and, you know, when you get it down, it really makes a lot of sense. And it can be brought down to the private practice level. Well, and on the um, value-based you know? care, is sort of forcing some of that, right? So we have MACRA and MIPS scores mm -hmm. now that are still, you know, they, they were the last to come in with healthcare reform. So they're still a little... Um, I would call it light in the in the measurement, meaning they're not terribly yeah. challenging. But you know, if you look at where hospitals insurance companies are, they're way more challenging now. So the physician mm -hmm. office is eventually going to have to have, you know, key performance measures and and understand mm -hmm. what's an input and what's an output and 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 all these other things to be able to show that they're a quality organization. Yeah. Yeah. So I say this to many guests, I'm going to say it to you. We could go way further into this topic because it's yeah, for obvious reasons, but a, a couple of questions to kind of a few questions to sort of bring us to the finish line. First, I'm curious, I don't ask this question often, but I can ask it of you because you, you sort of look far to the future. What kind of predictions do you have? If you, you know, think 15, 20 years down the road, you think about private practice and AI and just everything that's sort of intertwined there. Kind of, what do you see? What kind of predictions do you have? So, so we talked about that precision medicine model with pancreatitis. Yeah, I think you know, I'm going to come to my physician with my genomic profile and maybe even my epigenetic profile, mm -hmm. and, and with that, they're going to have an opportunity through AI to you know personalize the the, the system in in a way that just makes them allow them to anticipate. Okay. And I also think that we're going to have uh, more uh, patient engagement and health monitoring mm -hmm. um, going on through wearables. I mm -hmm. mean, right now I've got my my watch. I've got my, you know, um, is a great device for for stress and sleep and all that called the Paul Neuroscience that I use. And it's just producing data everywhere. Okay. And every year when I go for my annual physical, because of what I do, my, my general practitioner, I nerd out for a while. He's like, why don't I have this data? And so, you know, they used to say when when healthcare was starting, they talked about that sixty eight percent of the actionable, preventable data is actually outside of of acute care and physician care. So, mm -hmm. if they don't have this information, they don't have this information. So, I think it's coming, and then I think we're going to have uh, more collaborative care. Um, I think with the physician shortage coming up by twenty thirty, we're going to be forced to put our nurse practitioners and PAs to to work. A little mm. differently mm -hmm. and if you talk to them they will tell you that today they're not um practicing at the boundaries of what they were trained to do meaning their lower level jobs mm -hmm. i think from practicality we're going to have to do that and we're going to have the ability to measure and track these things yeah and um and then i think we're going to have predictive analytics models so that that people can actually take a risk and go after these value-based i mean you and i could sit here and say okay, I want to take on a value-based population. And, um, you know, I have two groups, one in LA and one in New Orleans, which mm -hmm. one's going to have more complex disease and obesity. Apologies to New Orleans, but you, you're statistically, <laughs> right? So, so yeah. I mean, you know, these are, are complex things mm -hmm. and, and, and physicians will have these things coming to them in the future. And over this time frame, do you see regulations catching up, you know, allowing so I think start, these things? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I think starts and stops. So I, I, I always say that uh, technology is far advanced to the the regulations and the policies and the laws that go with it. And we saw yeah. that, you know, we can see that with Uber, right? Remember the car, yeah. the, 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 the person, yeah. we stopped until we figured it out. So I think um, there's no doubt that we're going to have events in our journey here mm -hmm. that are going to stop and start. And I, I do think, um, we talked about this earlier, I do think there's going to be this, this, um, real debate on um open openness and cybersecurity. it's going to be mm -hmm. uh, interoperability is what we need to get our costs down yeah. but we've got cybersecurity concerns so if i open my system up and then you come back and sue me for all the profits i made last year mm -hmm. i'm not opening up my system not right opening up, so yeah that's not fair either yeah. so that has to be sorted 
And then I got to ask you, you know, because you say AI and people think, oh my God, it's the Terminator future. It's going to become aware one day and we're all gone. There's that future. There's the, what we were talking about, the Star Wars future, right? Lots of droids, lots of killer droids, but they always obey their programming. Um, and so that's a different path. Like, is it some other path? Is it none of these? Is it one of the, what do you, you know? So I, I think I have a friend at, at it's the <laughs> Are we all going to die here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, his name's Professor Howie Chaucet. He's a roboticist, and he talks about you know everyone thought about robots was was going to be you know uh, George Jetson's uh, Rosie, right? Oh, there and, you go. There's and, another and one. He said, but happy. the reality, yeah. the first robot was your dishwasher, and and so <laughs> I I think you know we we certainly have. So some, we're on this path, or we just don't realize. Yeah. It. So I I think you know there's some debates now. There's obviously discussions on Q and Open AI debate we had you know with the. CEO and all that, but the mm -hmm. the issue on that is that AI doesn't do complex math very well, okay. and when complex math becomes available, there's a whole concern that the encryption world goes completely south, meaning everyone can break into everybody. So now Ew. you have military concerns and all sorts of concerns. Sure. So I think, you know, those are the starts and stops we're going to have. But I but I think right now in the short term, there's just so much uh, improvement to be made in just the the business of a physician practice that yeah. has maybe nothing to do with the clinical part you know you don't send tom cruise out to get sandwiches when you're a director of a movie yet you know we're sending our physicians into doing billing and all these administrative yeah. things we, we've got to get them back to be the stars right yeah. and and everything we should do in a practice should be to make sure that they and, and the, the nursing staff are optimized and I'll tell you what, I mean, that same concept extends to a bunch of the other staff in a practice too. One of my clients, I mean, the practice manager is doing, in my opinion, way more herself. Mm -hmm. You think about the more tasks you can push down lower and lower um, because you just, that's really the essence of them. It just hasn't been treated that way. And maybe this well, is we don't think about eliminating that. tasks either, right? So we-, we Yeah, we then there's that. that. I mean, that's that process excellence, I think, is that we yeah. need to- focus on um, removal in, in manufacturing, call it, call it non, non-value non added. Yeah. And so, right. So if process X has 10 steps and you really only need seven of them, but you still have mm -hmm. somebody who's for that process, for that process kind of overpaid to do it. There's two, yes. there's two things to solve there. Now the, the great news in healthcare in general is none of these should scare employees because we don't have enough of them anyway. It's true. Right? So, so this is, is something that I think, um, is a rare opportunity to have efficiency and improvement without harming anybody yeah. per se, yeah. um, which I think is, is unique to this industry. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, a couple of quick wrap up questions. First, we hit a lot of topics. It's a huge topic in and of itself. Uh, anything you think I should have asked you about you know, AI with private practices that I just didn't think to ask you. So the question is, where do you go to keep up on this stuff? And there's yeah. lots of places to read, but honestly, if you just look up, physicians and AI on, on YouTube, there's an amazing group yeah. of people that, that you can follow. And I, I'm trying to think of some of the names off the top of my head, but I, I go through medical devices and pharma, so I'm not going to be able to do that. But okay. there's, you know, people that actually report out on a weekly basis what's going on. And I, I think that's, that's very helpful. And of course, you know, I think podcasts like yourself are really offering people uh, on their daily mm -hmm. commute the opportunity to get cutting edge information. You know, I, I get it while w working out or, or yeah. driving or yeah, yeah. it's just, uh, it's, it's very productive. Yeah. And that leads to the other question, which is, so we've caught attention of listeners. They're like, you know what, we got to think about AI or automation or both. We got to think about our practice. Sometimes people get stuck at the starting line. They just don't know where to start. Any simple things they could do to get off the starting line is maybe one of them, you know what, start subscribing to things and just get smart about it. Um, so, yeah, I think there's two ways of doing it. The, the first would be, and this might be more un uncomfortable because there's, there's no one-stop shop to go to this, is, is get someone who can bring in some process excellence to your business and yeah. sort it. But the other way to go is, you know, you find a company like, say, Frasia, mm -hmm. and they will generally uh, bring in an implementation team and, and you know, get the 80 20 rule for you going so yeah no this so whatever your area is um mm -hmm. that you want to get better at compliance whatever it is there's there's generally someone out there that um you know wants to 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 sell you a, a software of one form or another and and right. in doing so they're going to provide the services to get you there yeah and maybe you know what pick pick a part of the practice like one little mm -hmm. thing 
and say, let's just try it there. If it really went south, it wouldn't hurt us, but let's just see what life could be like, what it's like to bring it in. What's it like to onboard it? What's it like to use it, train people? Um, in, in my little world in, in marketing, there's a bunch of tools that I use that have AI and automation built in. Mm -hmm. It is awesome. <laughs> I mean, yes. it is yes. really, are they perfect? No, but you know, tweaking something that's 90% there is a hell of a lot better than it is uh, having yes. to stare at a blank screen and go, what am I going to do now? It's, it's really worth a shot. Totally agree. Yeah. Cool. James, thank you for coming on. Pleasure. So appreciate it. Uh, you supplied a bunch of contact information that's all going to get into the show notes for your episode. So anybody who wants to contact you, they've got now another place to come contact you. So very much appreciate it. Very good. Thank a you. Yeah. A couple of things before we wrap up. First, if you uh, are on the business side of private, if, if you're a practice owner and you have some experience on the business side of private practice that you want to share with others, or if you're someone who serves private practice owners like we do, same thing, expertise that you want to share Really want to get, get you on practice care so that you can tell the world about it. In the show notes for James's episode, in every episode, there's a link, a couple of clicks. Tell us what's on your mind so we can get you scheduled as soon as possible. And finally, please subscribe to Practice Care. We're on all the major platforms. We drop a new episode every week. And the easiest way to stay up to date is to subscribe. So please do that soon. Thanks very much. And until next time.